Okay, welcome back everyone. It's 1030, so we're ready to get started in the second session of our day today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about forest invasives. So we're going to get into our first forest invasive session of the day, uh, talking about development in research and management. We have a great lineup of speakers, not only for this session, but the session after lunch as well as a continuation. Uh, so hoping you all can stick around for that too. Uh, Madison is going to be your moderator again this morning. I'm going to pass it over to her. Uh, don't forget, after this session, we will also have our networking session beginning at 11.50. Uh, so please join the expo and come say hello at our at our booth in the expo. Uh, thanks, Maddie. You can take it from here. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. It's great to have you all back here for our next session, the first Forest Invasives Developments and Research and Management session. Um, I just want to quickly remind you that um, if you have any questions for speakers, please pop them into the Q&A box and I'll read them out loud to the speakers after each talk. So with that, we'll get started here. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker of the session, Emma Hudgens from Carleton University, who will be discussing new perspectives in North American forest pest management. Thanks so much for being here, Emma, and I'll pass it over to you now. Thanks so much, Madison. Hopefully that's loading there now. Yep, it looks great. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks everyone for joining me as the first session, uh, first speaker in this session on forest management. I'll be summarizing the results of a recent survey and workshop that I co-organized with Joe Bennett and Brian Leung on forest invader management priorities from experts coming from across the management network. Um, and we're focusing specifically on Canada and also the United States here. So this work was done on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And if you were at the 2022 Ontario Forest Health Review, I apologize, but this is going to be a bit of forest health review for you. Just to give a bit of background on who I'm talking about today, you can group forest pests and pathogens into four feeding guilds based on how they feed on their host trees. So this includes wood borers like emerald ash borer or EAB, uh, defoliators that feed on leaves like the spongy moth here, sap feeders like the balsam woolly adelgid, and pathogen species like the chestnut blight fungus. And invasive forest pests are really unique among the threats to trees in terms of their ability to functionally extirpate them. And one really visible example here in Canada is emerald ash borer's impact on ash trees, which are one of the most popular trees in urban areas in Canada and the United States. So here I'm showing a a street before and after EAB has passed through. The goal of this workshop was really to develop a coherent set of forest management priorities uh, across this really distributed network of forest managers. And we were speaking a little bit uh, about silos yesterday in our keynote session. Um, so really forest management is done in this highly distributed way with actors that have different capacities and different incentives, and this can really uh, hamper coordinated responses. To give you an idea of what this web looks like in Canada, I've put some examples here. So there are federal partners either doing research, regulation, or surveillance. There's more coordinated management happening, happening for some pests at the provincial level. And then most of the actual on the ground uh, tree treatment, tree removal and replacement is conducted by municipalities or local managers and can be funded by NGOs like Tree Canada in terms of tree replacement. And I'd also like to highlight the Invasive Species Center plays a really key role in transferring knowledge across this network. So events like this one and also the uh, multi-agency Forest Pest Management Forum are really important for keeping communication going uh, amongst these groups. But there are also actors who have only really transient associations with this network, and I found myself being one of them uh, as an academic. I often found that I wasn't necessarily designing research projects with decision makers in mind. And another group that tends to be missing is uh, certain groups heavily impacted by invasions, but are not actually impact or not at the table in terms of management decisions. So indigenous governments and other groups are, are part of this uh, missing link in this network. And I was excited to see so many uh, indigenous presentations at this uh, at this conference. So it seems like things are moving in the right direction there. 
But for this study, we started by requesting free form input from experts on forest management priorities, what they thought were the most important topics. And we used this content to create a survey where respondents ranked the management topics and were also able to add additional ones if they felt that the list was incomplete. We used this survey as a basis of a, for a two-day workshop with a smaller group of partners where we refined this set of topics and discussed the more contentious topics. This also involved participants assigning quantitative rankings to different attributes of each topic, things like the amount of time it would take to solve the problem and the degree of public acceptance with the use of any associated tactics. And from there, I extracted overarching themes amongst these priorities and used them to structure uh, a, collaborative, a collaborative manuscript that is still ongoing, and I'll discuss the main themes that came out here. Here's a screenshot from our virtual workshop that was held uh, last January at the start of the Omicron wave, so we did it virtually. Uh, the survey and workshop participants included federal and provincial government employees, NGO employees, academic researchers, private policy researchers, and Indigenous knowledge holders. And during the workshop, we aimed to understand where and why people were diverging in terms of their rankings of importance not necessarily because we wanted to achieve total consensus, but we also just wanted to understand the conflicting values and incentives across some of these topics. And also given the lack of Indigenous perspectives included in survey responses and in forest management literature at large across government and uh, academic literature, we also spent the first day of the workshop in a more educational format with presentations and discussions focusing on the perspectives of Indigenous workshop participants. By the end of the workshop, we quantified each of these uh, topics, subtopics in terms of its novelty, feasibility, and other attributes. And I grouped all of these topics into five meta themes at, after the workshop. And I'll go through each of these now. So they include overcoming communication barriers, uh, assessing the trade-offs with alternative forms of management, making the best use of the suite of technological tools available for management, thinking about understudied or undervalued pathways of invasions, and finally making space for different ways of knowing about forest pest invasions. So as I mentioned in the outset, the distributed nature of the management network of forest pest management causes information loss. And this is something we've known for a long time and it's not unique to this sort of wicked problem. It's something that happens across these interdisciplinary problems. But in terms of forest management, those who are worst off are likely groups that have less money and time to devote to knowledge transfer and communication that have conflicting priorities like smaller municipalities uh, and other local communities. So we highlighted the creation of liaison positions within better funded government agencies as a potential strategy to tackle this. And also for a more coherent push to increase the modes of communication that different partners were using, uh, rather than just focusing on government reports and academic publications, uh, investing more in attending community events and participating in uh, things like radio programming and uh, on social media as well. I'll also present a quote associated with each of these themes from the workshop. So one participant said that none of the open science mandates are highlighted in our pr promotion criteria. It's an unfunded mandate. And this was a government scientist. So this shows a clear area where government agencies could be incentivizing their employees to do more of these communication, uh, do more of this communication work. The second theme, both in the survey and the workshop, was that there was a really big focus on putting an explicit either social, ecological, and or economic cost on different management decisions. And the management decision we felt really didn't have a cost right now was the choice to do nothing. And we felt like this was an area where policymakers um, could be demonstrating more transparency and really acknowledging that there is a cost to inaction in the face of invasions. And so that could be uh, seen as a research gap. We're highlighting those costs, particularly costs that are difficult to, to quantify in the form of dollars could really help uh, motivate more proactive decisions. So one private policy researcher said that our inability to quantify indirect impacts or impacts on less tangible resources may be why it looks like an invasion over time is not economically that big of a deal. So pointing to the kind of decision maker inaction or fatigue 
and this being one reason why it could be uh, not necessarily incentivized for them to take action. Our third theme focused on the large suite of technological tools available to manage invasions and where and when they have succeeded uh, and or failed. And across various technological tools, we found that proactive communication before a management plan is decided upon uh, was really key for their success and understanding the local context of any invasion uh, rather than applying a more one-size-fits-all strategy uh, for instance, perform the same form, the same management strategy across all of Canada, uh, actually honing in on the specific political, cultural, and ecological history of different landscapes, and uh, tailoring the technology that gets used to the community's needs and also to those context-specific factors. Along these lines, one participant said trust development is a two-way street, and policy developers needed to develop a trust with communities. So really um, highlighting that back and forth communication rather than a unidirectional flow of this is the management decision we've already made and here's what we're going to do. Our fourth theme focused on different areas where invasions are spreading quickly, but that aren't receiving as much attention and or funding. And one of these was urban forests. So we know urban trees are a really important bridgehead for invasions. They are stressed uh, areas where trees are likely stressed. They're also areas with a lot of incoming property oil pressure from people traveling among cities and a lot of shipments uh, ending up there. Uh, but they're also an area where we have a lot of uncertainty in terms of the host community. So there aren't uh, there isn't a large scale push to understand urban tree inventories. And right now those urban tree inventories typically only exist in wealthier communities. So communities that lack this information can't really plan for what the risks are based on the host trees that exist in their cities. And they also can't look at spatial patterns in where they might wanna do a different planting strategy. Another, tra uh, another pathway that we felt was under-examined was the trade of nursery stock. So we tend to focus on more proactive approaches and prevention of entry, which is obviously really important. We were just talking about that in the last session. But once we have failed that prevention step, we do still need to be thinking about ways to limit those impacts. And the nursery trade is likely a dominant cause of secondary spread once a pest has already entered. And it's also an area where there's a lot of jurisdictional issues in terms of whose responsibility it is to pay for those secondary impacts, given that the community that receives the pest isn't necessarily the one that sent those nursery trees there. So in terms of this first pathway, a forestry professor mentioned that when an invasive pest comes into a city, unless it's an unusual generalist, you need to know what its hosts are and what their distribution is. And unless you have an urban forest inventory, that becomes really difficult. So again, not understanding what the risks are to each community based on which trees are present. Secondly, in terms of the nursery trade, uh, the same professor said, I know from my state, there have been numerous introductions of infested hemlocks, uh, likely with hemlock lily adelgid, despite years of regulations in other states. And so the state that sent it out doesn't bear the cost of the introduced pest. So that's something we need to be discussing in terms of paying uh, for those secondary impacts. So the last thing we discussed was issues of ethics and making space for multiple paradigms in forest management. And this paralleled a lot of our discussions with uh, the other open communications with communities themes, but particularly when working with Indigenous communities, recognizing the historical exclusion of Indigenous peoples from forests and from forest management decisions needs to be taken into consideration. And another real important uh, facet here is ensuring Indigenous knowledge is treated with as much respect as Western knowledge. So a concept that we use here to guide our discussion was two-eyed seeing, which is a Mi'kmaq concept coined by Elder Albert Marshall, where both Indigenous and Western knowledge systems are placed on equal ground. And again, like any community, those proactive discussions prior to decisions being made, it really came out as the most important thing. And along these lines, one participant said the pest issue is more one of land and territorial integrity for Indigenous people. You have deciding people descending on Indigenous communities, and they make the decision without consulting the communities it touches. So again, um, linking with that historical distrust and ways to move forward from that. 
so to bring all these themes together, uh, we used a case study that exemplifies our main themes. And one example that really captures all of these is the current landscape of solid wood packaging material interception and inspection in Canada. So firstly, in terms of barriers to communication, this is an area where data are not published online. They're not very easily accessible by the public. And secondly, they're collected by Canada Border Services Agency, or CBSA. And so this is an agency that has a bunch of different incentives. They're required to limit all different types of threats that come in on imports. And some of these can be seen as much more life or death than pest infestations, so things like drugs and weapons. So it's likely seen as less of a priority. And on top of this lack of accessible data, CBSA only records positive interceptions of pests. So we don't have a baseline understanding of how much effort they are putting into inspection over time. This makes it hard to disentangle patterns from mechanisms. So we don't know if we see an uptick in interceptions, if this is because their effort is increasing or if this is because invasions are increasing. In terms of technology use, CBSA uh, employees receive sporadic training from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for identification. Uh, but again, those conflicting incentives can mean that it's only one of their many things that they're working on, and so it may not be seen as a priority. There's also a promise in terms of using DNA barcoding in inspection, but this isn't something that's mainstream yet. In terms of underexamined pathways, one major source of untreated wood volume coming into Canada is likely wood bracing materials, also called wood dunnage. And there's currently no mandate to examine these wood bracing materials, although there could be some promising developments on the horizon. But again, it all comes back to those conflicting incentives. So finally, in terms of equity, the uh, prevailing injustice here is that the people who are gaining the most from these risky imports are likely not those most heavily impacted by their associated invasions. For here, you can think of people like working class communities reliant on the forestry sector. So I'll finish off with our quantitative scores for these different themes. And this allows us to look at the different facets that cause these themes to be a challenge, which are not all the same. So some themes are not necessarily new, like breaking down these silos. Like I said, it's something that's really common, uh, but they're very time consuming and complex. Whereas in terms of these equity issues, it's not something that's on the public's uh, mind right now. It's something that's really only being discussed within Indigenous communities. And so this kind of puts all of these, these themes into perspective. And I hope that this work can allow the entire Forest Pest Management Network to sort of zoom out and put these various challenges into perspective and get a sense of important ways forward. With that, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my fellow workshop organizers and rapporteurs, my current and past labs, and all the experts who participated in this project. And I'd also like to honor one of our workshop participants and co-authors, Gary Lovett, who sadly passed away this December. Um, and he's left an impressive legacy of many decades of commitment to plant health behind. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Emma. That was a wonderful talk. We have a, a time for one question here. Um, this person says, hi there, great talk. The city of Hamilton has been trying to apply this proactive approach for estimating cost of invasions by using our urban tree inventory to better quantify drivers of mortality. Do you have any recommendations on how to do this? Sorry, what, did, could you repeat the question, the urban tree yeah. mortality? No problem, maybe I read it too fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they said um, they've been trying to apply this proactive approach for estimating costs of invasions by using our urban tree inventory to better quantify drivers of mortality. Do you have any recommendations on how to do this? Sure, um, I think something that's really important for that is to have repeated inventories over time. And that obviously takes, takes time to, to start and to measure. Um, but one thing you might be able to do is kind of back out how long it's been since different pests got there and what you would expect that tree volume to be compared to other communities. Um, I also have a paper that, that did that for the United States uh, that I can post in the chat uh, that might be able to get, give you a sense of the mortality risk associated with the different pests uh, and likely drivers of urban tree distributions so that you could get an idea of what those would be, but it's, it's quite challenging until you have repeated inventories over time. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. 
Well, we really appreciate your time and your presentation. It was great having you. We'll Thanks. move on to our next speaker here. Um, I'm happy to introduce Jeff Fair from Natural Resources Canada here as our next speaker. Jeff's presentation is on adaptive silviculture for climate change, managing for warmer and drier conditions in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest region. So excited to hear your talk, Jeff. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks a lot. All right, let's get the screen. All right. We can see, we can see your notes there. Oh, okay. This has a heads up. Yeah. How's that? Pain? Oh, there's there's still up. <laughs> still up. I think you can change the display setting at the top of the power. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that looks great. Okay, there we go. We're all set. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. So we're going to switch gears and talk about some kind of some hardcore kind of forestry stuff now. So uh, my name is Jeff Farah. I'm a forest research officer with uh, Natural Resources Canada, the Canadian Wood Fiber Center based out of Sault Ste. Marie Fair and focusing on forest silviculture and, uh, and uh, bioeconomy. And, uh, so Today I'm going to give a presentation about the adaptive our adaptive silviculture for climate change research project managing for warmer and drier conditions in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest region. So this project. So uh, this is it's typically a 40 minute presentation, but I'm, I'm condensing down to 50 minutes. I'm going to try and fly through this pretty quickly. Um, and give you an overview of what we're working on and what we're doing. Uh, so this project is a Canadian Wood Fiber Center, Natural Resources Canada led project. Uh, our team is with Dr. Trevor Jones, uh, Dr. Nelson Tipo, myself, Mike Pokting, Tim Barsanti, and Liz Cobb. Our adapt their, the Adaptive Civiculture for Climate Change Research Network is actually a larger network based uh, across North America headed up by researchers within the United States, Dr. Linda Nagel with the University of uh, Utah, um, uh, Maria Genoviak out of uh, Marquette, and the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Research, and uh, Chris Swanson with the US, uh, USDA Forest Service and a variety of other research uh, projects and networks across the US. I think we're up to about 15 different research installations across North America. Ours uh, at the Petawar Research Forest being one of two Canadian sites, the other one being up in the John Prince Research Forest up in northern BC. So the goal of the research network is to create a multi-region study uh, with locally suited climate change ad adaptation treatments using expert panel, using an expert panel of regional scientists and as well as local managers. So this isn't just a research study. This is an operational uh, meant to function within a normal forest industry context and creating solutions that can be applied to the real world. Um, saying this, it also introduces natural resources managers to conceptual tools and approaches that help to integrate climate change into resource management and civil culture decision making. So real world solutions for real world problems such as, as climate change is really, really what attracted us to joining this network. The AS Network uh, project is built off re-adaptation treatments, and it's looking at your acceptance to force change and your risk tolerance under a climate change scenario. So there are three treatments, which is resistance, resilience, and transition, which is going to help you manage for that change in the risk tolerance and how much you're willing to accept your force to change. So the first is resistance, which is you want to improve the defenses of your forest against, against change, and you want to maintain relatively unchanged forest conditions. So the forest that you have today, 
going forward through time, through climate change and the different uh, changes that are going to impact our forest, you really want to still have those services and how your forest looks today be there 100 years later. Resilience says, okay, I understand that the, the climate is changing and I'm willing to accept a little bit of change, but I really want to keep what's, what I enjoy with our forest now there going forward into the future. So you accommodate some degree of change. And when change happens, you want to be able to set yourself up so you can respond to that change and return your forest back to the condition uh, of uh, before the disturbance. And then transition says, okay, I, I understand that really change is coming. Um, it's going to impact my forest. I want to prepare my forest now to be able to withstand those dramatic changes going forward into the future. And how can I prepare my forest now for that future climate condition? Uh, so those are the, the three main uh, treatment scenarios uh, that you go into the research forest, that you go into creating the research project based around. Yeah, it's a large research project. When you get into this, each of the, re each of the treatments are eight to 10 hectares in size. Everything's scientifically uh, re replicated. And you're going to be looking, it's a long-term research study. So you're going to be looking at, you know, uh, forest health, productivity, diversity, uh, your understory health, and everything that you can monitor for change going forward in the future. So our research project, uh, we wanted to host it. We thought a great place to host it would be at the Petawa Research Forest. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with the PRF, it's located uh, near Petawa, Ontario, which is about two hours west of Ottawa on, high, on uh, Highway 17, the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, it was established in 1918, and so it has over 100 years of forest research conducted within the forest. It's one of two federally run research forests in Canada gives us, uh, so that going into it, gives us control over how we want to manage our forests, uh, gives us that, uh, that long-term sustainability, that long-term outlook that we know our forests are going to be, our research can be gone, can be studied and going and be looked at at the point into the long-term. And it gave us a, a kind of uh, an idea of, of being part of a larger research community at the research forest. And it's a great place to do knowledge transfer. It's easily accessible and we do tours there all the time. So this was a great place to uh, host uh, such a project. The PRF is located within the Great, Great Lake St. Lawrence Forest Region, uh, which is a mixed, uh, mixed wood forest condition, a multi-entry uh, harvesting regimes and silviculture regimes take place in the forest. So what does that mean for climate change? And with working within the Great Lakes Forest, St. Lawrence Forest Region, and really the entire world at this point, um, so specifically, as we look forward into the future for the Petawawa Pembroke area, uh, focusing still, we're still on that RCP uh, 8.5 modeling pathway for, for climate change. What is, how is this going to impact our forest? So we know the, what the temperature is really going to get wetter and warmer. So our line graph there is our temperature from our historic to our uh, future outlook 2051 to 2080 and as well as so the bars are the precipitation graph so you can see in the fall winter and spring months we're getting more precipitation but warmer weather so what does that mean for the former precipitation it's basically like a, a winter we're having this year where we're seeing more wet snow less snow um it's uh, coming in different ice and rain and those conditions, which impacts our summer months, which are actually getting drier and warmer. So if there are spring and shoulder seasons are, are um, we're having less snow loads and they're drying out quicker, that's just gonna accelerate the drought that will be occurring into the, into the future within our forest. So how do we manage for that change within our forest is kind of the study of the project. Uh, to do this, we use the seedware model, the Natural Resources Canada seedware model uh, produced out of the Great Lakes Forestry Centre, which takes your, uh, takes your location and where your climate will be uh, for a given period for this. So we're looking at the, the climate period of 2041 to 2070, and it says, okay, at Petawa at 2041 to 2070, this is your climate. Where is that climate right now? And this shows us it's matching more towards that orangey area. So it's moving south and west. So that's that higher, drier kind of prairie conditions, that Midwest, Indiana, Wisconsin, lower Michigan, 
uh, West kind of scenario. So that kind of gave us some food for thought of how we're going to, what type of forest do we need to prepare a current forest uh, for for the future? So we're already starting to see signs of, of change, you know, higher, wetter snow loads, uh, wet snow loads, snow press going on, drought within our forest, forest fires occurring um, within our forests, uh, higher mortality and uh, increased uh, insects moving up from the south and coming into our forest. So this climate is changing, but we need to remember our soil is not changing. So how do we manage for that? So a big part of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest region is managing for white pine, uh, specifically white pine, oak mixed wood forests. And how do we manage for that? So this was our forest type that we wanted to focus on going forward into the future. So in 2018, uh, we got the okay to join the Adaptive Civil Culture for Climate Change Research Network. 2019, Maria and Linda and Courtney came up from the Ask Network and helped, uh, helped us hold a three-day workshop where we get forest practitioners and researchers from, uh, from the area and uh, really across the Eastern Seaboard that came up to give input about how do we, how can we create a civil culture package that we use by industry going forward into the future uh, that will give us insight to manage for climate change. So with that, we came up with these scenarios. So first is resistance. So again, that's managing. You don't really want your force to change a lot, but you want to prepare it going forward to the future. So we were enacting the uniform sheltered wood harvest uniform sheltered wood harvest system, which is normally done within a white pine uh, forest today. Uh, do your chemical mechanical site prep, and the major change for preparing for climate change is we wanted to plant uh, white pine. That is, eighty percent of the seedlings that we plant uh, in our area will be from southern seed sources matched to three climate zones using that seedware modeling for the 2011 to 2040, 41 to 2070, and 2070 to 2100 uh, within our forest stands. So the major change, like I said, is those seedlings uh, are assisted migration being put into the ground. The second treatment is resilience. So that's having that flexibility to respond to climate change, but returning it to the original condition. We went with an expanding gap of regular shelter wood. Um, creating basically making Swiss cheese or forest, creating these holes in the forest of 50 meter clear cuts, uh, planting within those clear cuts of white pine, red oak, and white oak uh, from one to two seed zones, southern seed zones. And those gaps will be revisited in 20 years to be expanded going forward in the future, or done as we've seen the climate is changing, we can put in a new civil culture treatment within those areas as we move forward. So this gives you the flexibility to to harvest the forest, start implementing some change, some adapt climate ad adaptation uh, within that forest, but be able to respond to the forest as it's continuously changing going forward. And then the third treatment is transition. So this is really saying, taking a hard look at your forest and taking a hard look at your forest climate condition going forward. So a hotter, drier growing condition. And specifically, we're focused on those sandy, growing, growing our forest on the Canadian Shield. So that sandy, shallow soil conditions where drought is just made even worse is amplified going forward. So how do we manage for this? What do we look at? So we had to take a hard look and say, you know, if our forests are already being drought stressed, putting them under more stress, what does our forest look like? What's going to be able to survive there? And then really pushing it towards an open grown civil culture system. And what grows in an open grown civil culture system currently in our area, that's jack pine and red pine. If things are more of a southern nature, um, where does that, what does that leave us with? We already know red pine is already struggling with drought because it needs more of the, the deeper sander, sandier soils, which are not found on these sites. Jack pine would be ideal in this current situation, but it is already at its southern seed source, or it's at its southern um, uh, southernmost line for growing. That we started looking what species are out there, and pitch pine is what we came out with. It was historically has been in the area. Uh, it's naturally found around the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway, and down in the U.S. So we decided for this site, it's accepting that change and accepting that growth condition going forward. Uh, we're going to clear cut, 
clear cut with seed tree, do our mechanical or chemical site prep, and plant in our in our open grown area some red pine, pitch pine, red oak, and white oak, and different cell and seed sources. Uh, as with any scientifically replicated study, we have our control, which is a no action. Uh, see how these forests perpetuate going forward into the future. And for us, we put in a second control, which is our business as usual, which is a, do a normal harvest, do your normal shelter wood, do your site prep, and plant with your local white pine. So you're able to compare what is normally done through all stages uh, and all treatments going forward into the future and see how your forest is responding now, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, all the way through the future under each one of these growing conditions. And as that climate change keeps getting amplified. So it's a large project. It's 168 hectares that we have taken out of the Petawa Research Forest to dedicate to this research project. Uh, we're making progress. Uh, the, the sites are in, the harvest has been completed, and we're really looking forward to uh, this fall where we're going to be doing our tree plant. Some quick pictures of where we are with everything. So the uniform shelter wood, that's what's normally done. A regular shelter wood, the gaps are in and our clear cut is in and uh, the trees are being moved and, and things are ready to be planted. So the interesting part of this and what we has been a real learning curve for us uh, is the seed sourcing and procurement. When we went into this, we're thinking, okay, we want seed sources from the US. We should be able to call up, you know, a couple of nurseries and find our, our seed and go from there. So it, which is proven extremely difficult. We're, uh, we've used the Forest Gene Conservation Association has been excellent. Uh, they're doing our procurement for us. And that meant going out and finding red oak, white oak, pitch pine, and white pine from uh, from the states. So there's no network. There's no real, hey, this is what I need. And there's a whole, uh, one, one nursery will find, talk to another nursery and find your seed that you want. It's been, uh, Carrie and her team have been out there calling individual nurseries, trying to find us uh, seed for, uh, for our project. Uh, we discovered white oak, and even red oak has been a horrible uh, seed crop year, seed crop years for the last five years. We barely got what we needed. White pine, the states are telling us they use our white pine uh, and for, for what they have. So trying to find a white pine seed source has been uh, almost, uh, almost impossible. We found some stuff that's growing down in Virginia. Um, so this has been a real difficult um, uh, learning curve for us going forward in the future. And this is just one project. Can you imagine if all different forests across Canada, even Ontario, start looking for seed for growing uh, their forest? How are we going to do this and how are we going to implement a network and a real uh, process to transition and find seed source and bring it across the border and bring it and start growing these seedlings going forward in the future is a real area that I think needs to be improved and a communication strategy between Canada and the U.S. is uh, there's room to grow there anyway. So that's been very, very interesting for us. So here are some numbers. So in total, uh, we're looking at plants in about 1,700, 2,000 stems per hectare from uh, using white pine, red oak, white oak, and uh, pitch pine from the different climate periods going forward. And again, using that seedware model to figure out where we should be getting our seed sources from. Hey, Jeff, so, you have uh, about one minute left. Okay, perfect. I'm basically done. So we're making progress. Uh, we have got great collaboration across the board, a um, variety of partners going forward into the future and to study uh, how these each one of these treatments will uh, survive and grow going forward into the future. And with that, uh, I'll hopefully get a couple questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. What a wonderful talk. We do have a couple different questions here. Probably just time for one or two, we'll see. Um, can you draw any common conclusions from this research on how this process could be applied to urban forests? Um, yes, yeah, so there is, uh, if you go on the ASK website, I forget it is, they've just put in one uh, adaptive subculture for climate change research, uh, urban, uh, urban research project within the U.S. I want to say it's in Milwaukee, but I might be totally wrong, but there, there is one. 
So um, if you'd like to get more information, try the Ask Research site. Um, there should it should be up on the research site. If not, give me a call and I can find out more information about uh, the urban conducting one of these experiments within an urban setting. Thanks so much, Jeff. There are a few other questions here in the Q&A box. So just in the interest of time, we'll have to move on. But if you don't mind just sticking around and answering those, that would be really great. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. You had a wonderful presentation and we appreciate it. Thank you. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Flora Espito from the Pennsylvania State University, who will be speaking about the impacts of spotted lanternfly on the grape and wine industry. Thanks for being here, Flora. I'll pass it over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to share my screen here. Um, yeah, your screen is up. We're just looking. I it. hope it works out. Let me put it in <laughs> presentation mode. Oh, the the slides went away. We can. Oh, there we go. All right, all set. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the impacts of spotted lantern ply on the grape and, and wine industry. So there is definitely an economic impact. Um, however, it is hard to tell how much. Uh, this is um, what we have here in the screen is a study that was published in 2019. And it looked at um, potential economic impacts of spotted lanternfly on a wide variety of crops. And according to this study, the estimated direct economic impact of spotted lanternfly on grapes could be up about 2 million per year. And this estimate is based on an assessment of the crop's susceptibility to a spotted lanternfly and the crop value in different zones, like in the quarantine zone of Pennsylvania, in the adjacent counties, and within the state. So this number, I'm pretty sure if this study would be done again, it had changed because the quarantine zone has expanded as we have now many counties uh, with spider lanternfly. So from this um, study, we can just tell that there is, again, this is just an estimation of the economic impact of this insect on various crops. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the insect itself. A spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper and it has, um, it feeds by sucking up the juice from the plants, like the phloem. So the mouth parts work like a needle, like, like a straw like structure. So, and it, they are um, right here in between the legs, and the insect just pierces the plants with these mouth parts and then it sucks up the phloem from the plant. And um, what I have here is uh, two pictures on how to distinguish males and females. Females are very easily to, um, they're very easily to take apart because females have this red coloration in the tip of the abdomen. Okay, so a spotted lanternfly feeds on many different plants and the feeding preference of this insect changes as it develops. So the nymphs seem to prefer herbaceous plants, whereas adults seem to prefer wooded tissues. However, when it comes to grape, we have found that all stages are able to feed on these plants. So for example, and this is here we have the, a picture of the growing season of um, and how grapes look like at these different times. So this would be early June and this would be November. And uh, the insect has a one year life cycle. So nymphs are starting to show up in May and early June. And those early nymphs, uh, nymphal stages do feed on the young uh, leaves and um, young plant tissue that is developing in, in, in that, that, that time of the, of the season. And then uh, the insect can feed, all the instars can feed on grape. And adults, the adults are particularly problematic because those uh, arrive at the end of the season and they feed voraciously on grape. And so over here in the next slide, uh, this graph shows the number of lanternfly individuals in vines 
from May to November. And what we can see here is that neems uh, can be found in the vineyards, but especially early in the season. But the greatest number of lanternfly individuals are seen at the end of the growing season. You can see this great peak. And these, these are adults that feed voracious neon grape, and they need to be controlled. So this peak of lanternfly infestations is specifically problematic because it overlaps with harvest. So growers need to use products with short pre-harvest intervals with little or no residual activity. And this leads to basically have to apply more often, which can be expensive, right? So from what we know so far, management efforts need to focus on these adult populations at the end of the growing season. We are currently studying the effect of NIMS on grape and yield and grape and health, but we still don't have data for it. For now, we just um, recommend growers to focus on controlling these adults. Okay, so the spider lantern fly makes, it affects the plant in two ways. One way is by feeding, directly by feeding on the plant, and especially when the populations are really high. So the insect doesn't necessarily feed on the fruit, you know, it doesn't affect, the, it doesn't feed on it, but it feeds on the canes, it feeds on the cordons, it feeds on the trunk of the vines. And they, because they are sucking up all of that sap, uh, they debilitate the plant and affect the ability to um, produce good fruit and also affect plant health. So another way in which the insect affects the plants is by um, secreting honeydew. So as they feed on this liquid diet that is rich in, su in sugars, they also secrete liquid that has a lot of sugars on it. And fungi use that substrate to develop. So these are honeydew secretions from the insects. And then what happens is that the, that sugar is great so straight for um, sudimol to grow. And when we see this, the plant is being affected because it inhibits um, photosynthesis. Plant, the plants are not able to capture all of that solar energy that they need. This is how it looks. This is a picture that we have um, from a vine in Pennsylvania, and you can see all of these Chinese pots. This is honeydew. No mold growing here yet, uh, just the honeydew. And well, in vineyards, spider lanternfly can be pretty problematic. So what we have here is a picture of a vineyard in Pennsylvania that was completely decimated by lanternfly. So why, why did this happen? Well, the insect is an invasive species and we didn't really know what we were dealing with when it first showed up. So when we look at the literature in South Korea, uh, which the insect is an invasive as well, the primary damage to grape was basically from the honeydew that was blocking photosynthesis in the vines. But what we are seeing here in Pennsylvania is um, a greater impact in which the insect is able to actually kill the vines. So data collected by uh, a previous entomologist here in Penn State, Heather Leach, for three years from nine vineyards um, has shown that increased levels of lanternfly on Vitis vinifera vines does correlate with a reduced number of clusters per shoot and also with um, the ability of the plant to survive cold hardiness and it increases uh, also susceptibility of the plant and uh, it, it can cause death, basically. Okay, so spider lanternfly enters the vineyards from the surrounding environment. The insect is highly polyphagous. The insect feeds on so many plants. So as long as there is food around, the insect can sustain, it, the populations can stay there. And then when the vineyards start leafing out and um, growing in the season, then the lanternflies go in there. 
So infestations are first detected in the edges of the vineyards. And these are places where the scouting and management should first take place. There is a study done here in Pennsylvania uh, that suggests that spraying the vineyard borders reduce spotted lanternfly populations by about 85%. So treating the borders uh, when, when the insects are there and also scouting for vegetation at the vineyard ages and, and probably treating them as well before they enter the vineyard. And this is just an example of a couple of traps that are being used for uh, lanternfly scouting. And this trap, so the, here we have one attached to this tree, and here we have a sticky trap. It's like a wand. And these traps should be placed on either tree of heaven trees or uh, black walnut, because those are good hosts for lanternfly. And if you are interested in knowing how to build these traps, just go to this link and follow the instructions. And what I have here is a list of chemicals that have proven to be useful to kill this insect. So the insect is easy to kill. It, it, many products are effective to control this insect. But what we need to take into account, well, in addition to these chemicals being um, permitted wherever we are, is the pre-harvest intervals when it comes to grape. Because remember, if we are controlling adults, we need products with, with short pre-harvest intervals because we are going to harvest those grapes soon. Okay, so there are a lot of things we don't know about this insect. And we are working on, you know, filling several gaps in knowledge that will hope, hopefully, I'm sorry, will hopefully help us um, design good management strategies. So in the time I have, I'm just going to talk very briefly about two research projects and what we have learned from them. So in the first study, I was, in the first study aimed to um, identify the effect of different spotted lanternfly densities on grapevine physiology. So this was done by uh, Michela Centenaris lab, and uh, this is his post her postdoc, Andrew Harner. And what they did, they cage um, Riesling grapevines in production, and they infested them with different densities of lanternfly. And then they measured starch and carbon accumulation in those vines. And what they found was they found a reduction in starch in the roots of those vines infested with lanternfly. So they found less starch in the vines that were infested with higher number of um, higher numbers of lanternfly, as you can see here. And this is problematic because we know that grapevines in the fall they start accumulating or mobilizing all of those nutrients into the roots and those reserves are what they are going to use for the following season. They also found a decrease in carbon assimilation in vines infested with lanternfly. So less carbon accumulation at higher numbers of lanternflies. So definitely the insect has an effect on the grape physiology of the plant. Um, another question we want to answer is, we know the insect feeds on grape and we commonly see it in the fall, but we didn't know really how good of a host grape is for the insect. So this study aimed to understand or to find out if the insect was able to develop in cultivated grapes and whether the insect um, fitness parameters such as growth, um, reproduction and survival were affected when the insect was feeding on a single diet or when it had access to a mixture of diets. And we particularly use grape, uh, Concord grape, and three of heaven plants, which is the preferred host of this insect. So we put cages, potted uh, plants in these cages, and some cages had grape, some cages had tree of heaven, and some cages had grape and tree of heaven. And what we found was that spider lantern fly developed faster when feeding on a mixture diet, a mix, a mixed diet of concord 
and three of heaven. So they develop faster. They require less growing degree days to develop. And when they were feeding on Concord exclusively, they took longer to develop. Um, regarding survival, spider lanternfly had higher survival when feeding on single diet, um, when feeding on the single diet of Tree of Heaven and the mixed diet of Concord plus Tree of Heaven compared with um, Concord alone. And regarding reproduction, lanternflies fed on Concord grape plus Tree of Heaven laid more eggs and had higher hatch, those eggs had higher hatch than those, than the ones uh, coming from females fed on single host diets. So what this is telling us is that um, the insect definitely requires a mixture of diets to develop. We are not sure, uh, lanternfly, um, lanternfly loves tree of heaven. So it seems like tree of heaven is really important, but um, not as a single host. So the way we can use this information is, or something that could be helpful that we can draw from it is that um, reducing tree of heaven plants might help reduce fitness parameters of this insect. So I know it's a task to reduce lantern, to reduce tree of heaven plants, to eliminate these trees, but that's sort of what we have been doing. And it seems to, there is a, um, a reason for it. Okay, so these are other projects that my lab uh, is currently doing. And I'm just, I'm not going to talk about them, but I just want to say that we are currently working on trying to assess economic decision levels. We are trying to estimate action thresholds for spider lantern fly in Betis vinifera. Because one of the situations that we have with grape growers is that grape growers, we can tell them how to identify the insect. We can um, educate them on what are the chemicals that can be used when in the season it needs to be controlled. But what we don't know yet is what, what is the time at which they should do it? Like, okay, if you find this many insects per plant, you need to treat the, the plant because beyond that density, the plant could be affected either the health of the plant or yield. So we don't have that information and it's um, critical uh, at the moment. So we are working on, on that. Um, there are a lot of resources online about lanternflies. So for any of you uh, interested, just visit these sites. These are just some of them in which you can find information. And there is a specific uh, fact sheet that was developed for in the control of this insect in vineyards and is right here. Okay, so in summary, what I have told you today is that lanternfly is a threat to the grape and wine industry. Um, other lanternflies peak in the fall and they need to be controlled. We still don't know what is the density at which we need to worry about, but for now, just controlling them is a good idea. Heavy infestations of lanternflies decrease carbon assimilation and carbohydrate storage in vine roots. They affect winter hardiness and they reduce yield and they affect wine quality as well. A sporer lanternfly has higher survival, faster development and greater reproduction when it has access to a mixed diet of grape and tree of heaven. So it is a good idea to remove tree of heaven plants from uh, vineyards or close to vineyards. And well, <laughs> I know this is not a very positive talk, but uh, I would like to think that we should keep a positive attitude. We know more about this insect now than we did before. And hopefully we will be able to develop management strategies that will help us deal with it. And with that, I'll take questions. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Thanks so much, Flora. That was really great. Lots of great research going on there and lots of good information. Um, we do have one question here, so we have a, we have time for it here. Um, does lanternfly pose a risk to native wild grapes? They do feed on wild grapes. Uh, we haven't really, I don't think we have looked at whether those grapes are killed by lanternfly or not. 
but they're definitely found in wild grapes. Good to know. Um, well, thank you so much for your, being here and you had a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Move on to the next speaker here. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Denise Beaton from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, who will be speaking on spotter lanternfly and the possible challenges to agriculture and forestry. We appreciate you being here um, and we look forward to learning more about SLF. Hello, thanks for the invite today. And can you see my screen? Yep, I can see it. Just gotta pop it into presenter mode. Okay, Beautiful. good. <laughs> All right, thanks for the invite and allow me to talk on spot. Ranger plan the potential impacts to agriculture and forestry. So I'll um, just provide a bit of background, like Flory already mentioned some of this stuff. Um, it is a plant hopper, it's native to Asia. It was first, first detected in North America in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it's continued to spread in the United States. So far, we haven't found it in Canada yet. Um, let's hope that stays that way. Um, it is a regulated pest of Canada by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA, and we do consider it a threat to agriculture and forestry industries. So in the U.S., there's been one generation observed per year consisting of four nymphal stages, an adult, and overwintering egg masses. So the first three nymphal stages, um, this insect is um, small, like the size of a tick at the start, and it's black with white dots. And the fourth nymphal stage is red in color. And the adults emerge in late July in Pennsylvania, and egg laying begins in September. So they're flown feeders and they can feed in swarms. And this insect pest, it, it's considered more of a plant stressor. They have piercing sucking mouth parts and they will pierce through plant tissue and suck the sap directly through the phloem of leaves, stems, branches, and trunks. Um, it, this can result in yield loss or quality reduction, reduction of cold hardiness and die back and even plant health, plant death. The first and third instars, um, feed on young shoots of perennials and annual plants. They have a fairly large host range. And the fourth instar nymphs and adults, they're able to feed, feed on the older, woodier tissues, and but they have a more restricted host range from what's been observed. And as mentioned in the other presentation, um, this insect will excrete large amounts of honeydew that promotes the development of sooty mold, which can interfere, interfere with photosynthesis. So for homeowners, it's considered a nuisance pest because they really don't like this sticky honeydew um, and the sooty mold that it leaves behind on their property. Um, but spotted lanternfly, it doesn't bite or sting people though. So that's one good thing. So spotted lanternfly, they're weak flyers, but um, they're good jumpers and even good climbers. Um, for long distance spread of this insect, it's facilitated by the movement of the infested materials containing egg masses. The females will lay eggs on smooth surfaces and these eggs are really difficult to see. Um, the adults and nymphs are excellent hitchhikers. They have these sticky feet that allow them to stick to surfaces like vehicles, um, which can move these insects over long distances. Firewood is also another high risk pathway for the long distance dispersal of this insect. So here's a recent map of the report distribution of this insect in the US. Um, the blue areas are where there's a infestation of it. And so, so far it's now found in 14 states. And um, just note that our neighboring states of New York and Michigan now have um, reported infestations, which is a bit concerning because it's getting really close now. <laughs> Um, in September 2022, there was an established population found in Buffalo, New York, um, which we heard may have been there for over a year. So if this is the case, um, then it seems that this pest can is able to overwinter with our winter conditions that are similar to ours in um, southern Ontario. Um, the CFIA recently published a risk management proposal for this insect, and they predicted that um, high risk areas for establishment of spotted lanternfly in Canada are in southern Ontario, the southernmost parts of Quebec, 
and the interior valley of British Columbia. And just with this buffalo find, it was in really close proximity to a residential area, a waste management service, a uh, career service, and railway. So there's potentially a lot of good opportunities for um, this insect to hitchhike a fair distance. There are more than 70 different plants, um, host plants for spotted lanternfly in North America. In Pennsylvania, they found that the preferred host was um, Tree of Heaven, Grape, Black Walnut, Silver and Red Maple, Willow, Sumac, Styrex, and Oriental Bittersweet, um, plus others. Um, but this insect will also feed on other crops, including corn, soy, alfalfa, hops, various herbs, cucumbers, fruit trees, and a number of, number of ornamentals like roses. But this activity is generally transient from what we've heard. Um, some unlikely hosts are conifers, black cherry, and Bradford pear. Um, however, um, in Pennsylvania, they had found that really depends on what is in the landscape. If there are no preferred hosts, they will feed on other plants or trees such as conifers, but will likely move on after a few days. Um, much of the information so far has had a lot of caveats because reported or um, repeated feeding and environmental stresses might influence what is at risk. So why do we care? Like who is at risk? And um, Flora set me up pretty good for this, so I don't need to go into too much detail on this. So um, we are most concerned for our grape industry based on the experiences in Pennsylvania. Um, it's also been reported as a nuisance pest that might like the flies, um, these insects flying around and landing on them when they're trying to enjoy a nice glass of wine. Um, and the grapes are one of the most valuable fruits in Ontario in terms of farm gate value. And if you take into consideration the whole supply chain, the total economic impact of this industry is estimated at over $4 billion. We're also really concerned for our nursery sector. Um, when Heather Leach presented before, when she was with Penn State Extension, she um, surveyed um, Pennsylvania growers a few years back about the impact of spotted lanternfly on the nursery sector. And their biggest issue in terms of the nursery industry has been an increased need for labor that's associated with inspections and compliance, and also with increased pesticide use and loss of markets and customers. So they've had to adjust loading the stock to coincide with times of day with lower um, spotted lanternfly activity. So during the morning, and they've also had to do installation of industrial fans at the loading docks to reduce the flight. Um, so there is a high risk of introduction via stock in um, vehicles. There has been a need for in-house inspections upon delivery, in-season monitoring and training of employees, and a lot of reporting. Um, the total economic impact of our nursery industry is estimated around 616 million based on the 2019 study. For homeowners, it's a nuisance pest with its mere presence. People don't like insects so landing on them, and you can just see in the left picture how it's just there's a swarm of it on a prunus tree, and you see the children's plays, toys um, right under that tree. As mentioned earlier, like spotted lanternfly can produce a lot of honeydew, um, which can drip down on people and um, vehicles and other things. And this sooty mold can stain objects. Like in the bottom right picture, you can see someone's deck steps that is black and shiny from the sooty mold. <clears throat> I imagine you probably don't want to sit under a tree or park your car under one of these if you have honeydew raining down on you. Um, honeydew is also a sugary substance, so it can attract um, stinging insects as well. For parks and forestry, um, spotted lanternfly is probably considered mostly a plant stressor. Um, uh, spotted lanternfly feeding will weaken the plant, making it less resilient to other insects and pathogens and environmental stresses. There is concern about damage to the understory and forest systems from the honeydew, the sooty mold, and associated slime, but so far, from what we've heard, tree mortality has only been observed with Tree of Heaven. Sooty mold does not directly harm plants or the surface on which it grows, but it does physically block the leaves, reducing photosynthesis. So understory plants may die because of the sooty mold buildup on the leaves. <clears throat> it also can be a nuisance pest um, <laughs> if it 
around the recreational trail. If there's a lot of like spotted lanterns of fly in the trees and it's raining down honeydew, um, people don't like that. So spotted lanterns fly can cause um, localized branch damage as well. And the picture on the left shows flagging on black walnut, which can result also result in canopy dieback. Um, there has been reports of death of black walnut saplings, and I believe maple saplings as well, um, from heavy um, spotted lantern fly feeding. <clears throat> but overall, the death of large trees has only really been observed with Tree of Heaven. So, what are we, Onapa, doing to prepare for spotted lantern fly? So it's been on our radar since 2014 when it was first detected in Pennsylvania. And so we did do some surveys <clears throat> at, <clears throat> excuse me, at high-risk locations in 2016, 2018, and 2021. And during those years, um, we didn't detect any spotted lantern fly. For 2022, our monitoring efforts, um, we had a total of um, 110 tree bands set up at 41 locations. Um, more or less in the southern regions of Ontario. Um, we added a QR code that on our tree band that linked to the CFI's website for more information in case people wanted to learn more. Um, we check these bands every two to three weeks and we use bug barrier tree banding. That's an inward facing um, sticky band. And we didn't detect any spotted lantern fly, which is good. And we received funding for the surveillance effort um, from the Ontario Brave and Wine Research Incorporated under their marketing vineyard and improvement program. And we're still planning um, our efforts for 2023. That's what we're going to do. Um, well, NAFRA has been doing education and outreach, focusing on our commercial growers for at least three years now. Um, we've written various blog articles to raise awareness and how to ID the past. Um, and these blogs have targeted our commercial growers. Uh, for the most part, um, we also put in articles in our Orchard Network newsletter we, and presented on Spotted Lunch Fly at various um, grower and industry short courses and workshops and um, talked about it at our integrated pest management skin training workshops. We've had displays and outreach material at the Canada Outdoor Farm Show and the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention. We've also invited speakers from the U.S. to educate our <clears throat> growers in speaker sessions at the convention as well. And we've done cross-promotion of invasive species center events. As far as Canada's response initiatives, as mentioned earlier, <clears throat> we've um, Spyline to Fly has been added as a regulated pest in Canada. Um, so if I published their risk management proposal that closed last week, where they communicate the pest risk management considerations, and they present options to manage the risk of um, its introduction and spread in Canada. So this agency felt that it wasn't feasible to impose specific requirements on all pathways and products from the infested areas. So they're going to focus on commodity specific requirements and specifically on the nursery stock and logs with bark. And so I mentioned earlier about the, the, the concerns that the Pennsylvania nursery growers have had with um, quarantine compliance. So if our growers, if, like if it's spyline flies introduced and our growers are in a quarantine zone, they could potentially be facing um, similar challenges. And for all other pathways and products, a uh, robust communication strategy will continue to be implemented to raise awareness. Um, and there was also a spotted lantern fly technical advisory committee and working groups formed. Um, OMAFRA has rep representation on all of these, and it's more about fostering this ongoing information exchange amongst our key partners and stakeholders. And we have a focus on education outreach and communication, risk mitigation, finding potential pest control products, and surveillance and detection strategies. And we still have a lot of um, <laughs> work to be done. As far as management tools, we've looked to the U.S. to see what they're using. Um, unfortunately, most of those products are being based out in Canada or they'll never be registered here. So this presents a problem not only for management, but also for our emergency response effort should um, these be required. We have prioritized this pest through our minor use program, <clears throat> which is a program where federal and provincial governments and pest control companies 
and growers work together to identify and secure pest control registrations for prior bait pest issues. So, so far we have no pest control products registered in Canada. Um, we do have a response and treatment working group that's working to get um, to identify potential products for crops most at risk and for other use sites, such as naturalized area. Um, Quebec, is my provincial land use coordinator, is leading this effort with support from Ontario and others on this response and treatment working group um, to prepare submissions for options that could be used in agriculture. So, so far we've had Danatol that was submitted for the controls Bottle fly for use in pump fruit and copa, um, which is a fatty acid salts product and also an organic option. It was just submitted for control of, um, just submitted for the control of bottle and fly on grapes, palm, and tender fruit and indoor ornamentals. So these packages will first need to be reviewed by the federal government before they are registered, if they are granted <laughs> registration. Um, so yeah, and we're always looking for other options. Um, so we're trying to keep up to date with the research being done on biopesticides and biocontrols. Um, it sounds like we're found promising biocontrols that are being evaluated in the US right now. So that's that's great. Um, Madison, do I still have time or am I out of time? Because I can stop it here. Oh, uh, you have a couple more minutes. Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> I've been asked about Tree of Heaven before. So what do we do about it, remove it or not? And Flory also um, touched on this as well in her presentation. Um, like it is a prefer preferred host for spiral angel fly, but it's not required to complete its life cycle. So removing it will not prevent the establishment of um, spiral angel fly if it is introduced. But Tree of Heaven could be used for vital surveillance. However, it's invasive. Um, it establishes bio. Um, root suckering and prolific production of wind dispersed seeds. In the US, they found they need to use herbicides to effectively remove Tree of Heaven because if you just cut it down, it will sucker. And um, so that you can't just cut it down. Um, so, also, if removed, it's not clear whether this could put more pressure on other potential you know, species in close proximity. So, I think right now there's not a good strategy on how best to deal with Tree of Heaven. Um, so we'll continue to keep um, up to date on the current research, but for now, don't plant it. And if you find it, please report it because it could potentially be used for biosurveillance. And it's just, um, with so many pathways that um, this pest could enter into Canada, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So more trained eyes out there and with rapid reporting of those suspect finds, um, will really help with um, early detection and rapid response. And if you're in an infested area, <laughs> try not to bring anything back with you. And if you um, do have any suspects by winter fly finds, um, please report them right away. You can do that through EDD maps, um, through um, the CFIA's website, or you can get in touch with the um, Invasive Species Center. And just a good report includes specific location, a photo, and if you don't have, can't take a photo, then a good description of the specimen. Um, so the host species that you found it on, behavior, presence of honeydew, things like that, and collect the specimen if possible. So put in a plastic bag or sealed container with rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer and place it in a freezer. So that's it for me. Thanks so much, Denise. That was really great. Lots of good information in there. Um, we do have time for one question, maybe two. Um, so this person just wants some clarification. Um, are you recommending that we don't remove Tree of Heaven if found? I don't know. <laughs> That's the short <laughs> answer. <laughs> like it's still, it's, we still want, need to discuss that because we're, we're not sure whether that would be a good strategy or not. Because, yeah. um, just with like with the tree bands that we're using, um, there's no lure. It's a passive um, trapping system. So early detection is really tricky. Like it's really tough when spiral enterprise in low populations. So some have wondered, well, if you keep the tree of heaven there, could it help with early detections? Because it tends to be attracted to the tree of heaven. So I I, I don't really know yet. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely lots of different factors to consider for sure. Um, just a quick question here. Um, 
This person says, bad news for trees in natural areas. Lots of wild grapevines already smother and kill them. If the vines are already on the tree and the insect comes along, would it then just move to the tree once it's done with the grapes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it, it could. It's whatever it's attracted to. Um, yeah, like we've heard with Tree of Heaven, like it comes to a certain time where um, when it's close to synapsing that um, it doesn't have enough of that pressure like with the phloem and it will move to other species um, because of that. Um, so it, it really depends on what's in the landscape and right. from yeah. what we understood. I don't have any working knowledge with it right now. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it stays that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes sense though. Um, we'll have one last question here. Um, can we get like the police, MNR, CA uh, enforcement people to pull over people with firewood and take it away? Oh, firewood is a really challenging one. It has been for other invasive species as well, like emerald ash borer and things like that. So um, that is one thing we are right now trying to develop a response plan on how to do this. So we're trying, we're gonna be bringing in MNRF to help with those types of decisions. We even talked to um, MTO, just starting discussions there on just when they do truck inspections at the, their check spots, um, just to like, could they potentially look for this? We could potentially provide training or see if I could. Um, so there's a lot we could do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Um, well, we'll wrap up this session here, but thank you so much for your time. It was a great presentation and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, that concludes our first half of the day here. Thank you to everyone, all of our speakers, all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to share, share some additional resources here. Um, as you may have seen, we already did launch our invasive species training program. Our online courses are for those looking to further their learning in invasive species prevention and management. Currently, we are offering invasive forest pest training and oak wilt training courses, which may be of particular interest for the folks tuning in here. We have both individual and team purchase options available, and you can get a certificate of completion at the end and even get continuing ISA credits. Um, so if you are interested, you can email us or visit our website to learn more. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mackenzie. Thanks so much, Maddie, for taking us through a great morning. Um, we will be starting our networking session right after this, so you can join us there at the Expo. Um, and we'll have our you know, plenary right after the expo as well. So please join us to learn about forest biosecurity um, in Canada. And then this evening, we will have our Invasive Species Centers Awards as well. Just a couple notes on joining the expo. Um, you can click on the expo tab right at the top of your Zoom events lobby on your web browser. Choose the resource or networking booth that interests you the most. There's a list of the booths uh, on the screen there. So you can enter the booth and then once you're in, you can click on the tab um, that says chat with us and we'll be waiting for you in the booth to have some fun lunchtime discussion. So thank you so much and we'll see you there.